Hey everyone, it's time for Joe Canto. Welcome, people. My name is Joseph Magdalena, a.k.a. Joe Mag, and we're here to talk about singing. Welcome to Episode 4, The Five Vowels. As I mentioned in our last episode, the five vowels are the bedrock of bel canto. So let's get to it. Where do we start, you might ask? Well, what I'd like to do is take some time to explain each of them individually, like I would if this were our very first private lesson together. I'm going to try to keep this simple, though. Discussing the vowels can take you down some very complicated and confusing paths. There is a whole science called linguistics that has its own nomenclature and uses its own symbols to denote all the different sounds. I'll give you a quick example of the kind of rabbit holes one could go down. In linguistics, the following is the symbol using the International Phonetic Alphabet, or IPA as it's called, not to be confused with the beer, for the sound E. 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 Why does it have a colon? I don't know. That's linguist stuff. Also, Here's an example of the kind of graphics linguists use to describe the tongue placement of the various vowels. Okay, one last example. Linguists describe the E sound, and I'm not making this up, as a close front unrounded vowel. I, 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 I'm sure your eyes are about to glaze over by now, right? So unless the study of linguistics is your passion in life, I think I'm just going to pass on that for now. Instead, I will be explaining the vowels mostly in the context of how they are notated by the Italians. You know, the Italians... E molto pericoloso, signorina. Molto pericoloso. <laughs> Carissima. Oh, speak it, speak it! A nostro buco milanese mm. con piselli. Mm. Melanzane. Mm. Parmigiana. Mm. Con spinaci. Mm. Dove la farmacia? Yes, yes, yes! I love that. Dove la farmacia? Where is the drugstore? <laughs> okay, maybe a tiny bit of science, just to show my linguist friends out there that I love them and that it's not personal. Allow me to tell you a story. I once took a trip to the San Francisco Exploratorium. Now, this was back in the day when it was located in the Palace of Fine Arts. It's now at Fisherman's Wharf. Anyway, they had this machine, and I'm pretty sure they still have it, in the sound area. Now, it was an enormous place, but I recall they kept it somewhere near the theremin. Oh, what's a theremin? I just so happen to have a clip of the guy who invented it, Leon Theremin, playing it. I know you're thinking, oh yeah, 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 that thing. That's what that's called? Yes, the theremin was actually invented in 1920 and is considered to be the world's first electronic music synthesizer. You've heard it on many songs, 
notably the Beach Boys' uh, Good Vibrations, also many science fiction soundtracks, and of course, my personal favorite. But I digress. Anyway, they had this machine at the Exploratorium near the theremin that did an analog approximation of the human voice. As I remember it, it had a hand-pumped bellows attached to a hose. On the other end of the hose was a double reed, basically the equivalent of a duck call. <coughs> You pump air through through it using the bellows, and that double reed creates a buzz, a sound wave. Not particularly remarkable, not particularly beautiful, but roughly the equivalent of the two vocal cords. Then that sound activator, shall we say, could be plugged into several clear plastic chambers that were shaped like the inside of a typical human mouth. The first had a narrow V-shape and approximated the tongue position of an E sound. You pump the bellows with the duck call plugged into that chamber, and lo and behold, the thing went E. You plug the double reed into the next chamber, the one shaped like an A position, pump the bellows, and it goes A. Put it in the A ah chamber, and it goes Ah. There were also chambers for the lip sounds, making you go Oh, and finally, ooh, lots of fun. It was quite a cool contraption. Real Henry Higgins kind of stuff. That's a reference to My Fair Lady. Uh, I'll put a link in the description for this video um, to the San Francisco Exploratorium's website where they have pictures of it if you're really curious to get a look at it. But my point is, it provided an interesting and useful visual. The thing that's on the inside, you got to see on the outside. An old-fashioned analog version of, say, a modern sonogram. And you know what? The machine was ingenious, because once you've seen it, you realize that the making of the vowels is really not so complicated. Okay, let's get back to the five vowels with some graphics. Now, as I said before, I'm going to use a simpler version as used by the Italians. You know. The first vowel is E. 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 As in pizza, or spaghetti, or linguine. It's made by arching the tongue hard up against the roof of the mouth, toward the front. E. Remember, it's not a letter in the alphabet. It's just one of the many sounds we humans make. Like if you saw a mouse and went... Eek. E is the first and tightest tongue sound, focusing the voice, compressing the sound wave, like placing your thumb on the edge of a hose so that the water squirts out further. As a result, E is one of the most piercing and also annoying sounds we humans can make, projecting over a great distance. E. Number two is the A sound. E. E. A is another tongue vowel, like E, but slightly less tense on the roof of the mouth. Think, hey, stop that. The mouth is open a little more allowing a little more room for the sound to escape. The tongue presses against the top of the mouth, 
still towards the front, but not quite as close and not quite as tight as E. It's almost as piercing as E, but there is less compression on the sound wave and it travels just slightly less far. A. Number three is the ah sound. Ah. Ah. Ah is also technically a tongue sound in that there is still no particular influence of the sound by the lips. But as tongue sounds go, it is the most neutral. The mouth is open slightly more. There may be a slight tension in the tongue. It's back a bit further than A, but that's getting more into linguistics again. From a singer's perspective, though, I like to think of it as the most natural, unaffected sound we humans make. It's the reason why the doctor tells you to say, ah, before he looks down your throat. Open your mouth and say, ah, and you're practically singing already. Think I'm kidding? See if you can count how many ah sounds are in this one. Tons, right? Okay, three down and two to go. Numbers four and five on the list are respectively O and O. Here are the graphics and sound bites for both. O. 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 These are the lip vowels, and I'm going to be grouping them together because they are closely related. For many, these are the two hardest. Part of that's because it's not just about the lips, but also about what happens on the inside of the mouth. As we drop the jaw and open the mouth more and more, it causes the lips to close over the teeth slightly, like a drawstring. The tongue placement is relevant to making this sound but only insofar as it's getting back and out of the way. It's not irrelevant from a linguistics viewpoint. They have a spot you remember from the chart where they say the tongue goes. But for the purpose of singing, I'd like to think of it as simply switching over entirely from those earlier sounds that were shaped mostly by the tongue to ones shaped mostly by the lips. And here's why the tongue sounds are difficult. The tongue is one of the stronger muscles in the body. Surprisingly so. The Guinness Book of Records lists the greatest weight lifted with a human tongue at 12 and a half kilograms. That's approximately 27 pounds, nine ounces by a guy named Thomas Blackthorne of the UK on August 1st, 2008. So, after we've gone on explaining how to control and shape the sound with the tongue, I'm now asking you to forget all that, relinquish that control, and in fact, get the tongue the heck out of the way. I know, you're thinking, what? But, but we just... Yeah. And to make matters worse, where the tongue sounds compress, focus, and project the sound outward to different degrees, the lip sounds do the complete opposite. They happen in close. The sound doesn't travel very far. It's all on the inside. 
One of the side effects of that is that it can be very disorienting. It vibrates like crazy in your other resonators. I'll give you an example. Have you ever been on a phone call where there was a feedback or a delay where you were hearing your own voice in an echo loop? Very distracting, right? When we make the sounds, oh, or ooh, we are dropping the jaw down to create a larger chamber inside of our mouth. One that, when done correctly, can actually feel, well, just weird. At least at first. As a result, the temptation is to try to re-engage the tongue more, which winds up flattening out the sound. Uh, instead of oh, uh, instead of ooh, for example. Sometimes accents are to blame for this. Those can be tough enough to give up, a topic I think we may cover in more detail in some future episodes. But simply put, we can talk faster if we don't open our mouths that much. So, depending on how and where you originally learned to speak, uh, this might go against your natural instincts. For instance, I'm originally a New Yorker, and we talk pretty fast. So, you see where this might have been difficult for me. Here's how you can tell, though, if you're doing it right. As I said, think of the lips as the mouth of a bag with a drawstring, covering up the teeth. The more you open your mouth on the inside, the smaller the drawstring on the outside tightens. Look in the mirror. Open your mouth and say, Oh. If you're doing it right, you'll see the lips naturally make a round O shape. Oh. If you don't, you'll see this. Oh. No lips, right? Same thing for ooh. Whereas O has a rounded shape, ooh has an even tighter pucker on the outside. Inside, it's enormous, and the resonation is so eerie that you can easily understand why we use the ooh sound when doing an impression of a, a ghost. Ooh, ooh, right? It's, it sounds out of body, like it's not even you that's making the sound. Very scary. So, to summarize the lip vowels, drop the jaw to open the mouth some, while moving the tongue back and out of the way, which causes the lips to make an O sound. Drop the jaw and open the mouth even more, and the lips will make the oo sound. Okay, so that's the big five. To summarize all five, allow me to show you some hand puppets in profile that I like to use to demonstrate what the mouth does for each vowel. E, A, A, O, Ooh, I know, you were probably expecting higher quality graphics. Maybe someday I'll get around to that, but to be honest, this was how I learned it, and it's probably all you'll need to get the basic concept. I should also mention, these are by no means the only vowel sounds. For example, in between E and A is I. In between A and A is A. In between A and O is A. In between O and U is U. As in good. Anyway, it goes on like that. And perhaps someday, in another episode, I'll break down those as well for you. But they are only important as to how they relatively fit in between the big five. The five vowels, E, A, A, O, U, are the most important. They are the most singable vowels of all. And if you practice nothing else but those five, you'd still be well on your way, like 80 to 90% of the way 
to singing with ease. Whew. Now, I know this took a while to get through. I'd give real money if he'd shut up. As I said in the beginning of this episode, this is the kind of ground I'd want to cover but once, in the first private lesson only. After that, the concepts might be refreshed in small doses once in a while here and there if necessary, but that's about it. This is something I feel singers should know about, generally speaking, but not be too burdened with. I know from personal experience how neurotic singers can be, and ultimately, I want you to be able to sing without worry, to be free to make music and communicate without being distracted. You came here for a voice lesson, not a college lecture, and I'm sure you're getting antsy to get to it by now. So, without further ado, I'm going to show you how we put all this stuff together in the final episode of Joe Canto, Episode 5, How to Practice, up next. Hope to see you soon.